Hello and welcome to episode 45, Christianity, Gender and Society, part 2, where we'll be discussing secular challenges and responses to the church's teachings on gender. Out now, our audiobook, Developments in Christian Thought, is free to download on all major podcast apps and at our website, thepansycast.com forward slash audiobook. For more information, take a little peek in the iTunes description. The audiobook is made up of 24 chapters equally divided into two parts, which have been imaginatively named Part 1 and Part 2. Part 1 contains 12 in-depth discussions in which we talk through the history of theological thought within Christianity. In Part 2, we'll be interviewing some of the biggest names in theology and philosophy. To name a few, Eugene Nagasawa, Joseph Shaw, Eric Metexas, Christopher Rowland, Alison Stone, Michael Wilcox and David Ford, Peter Oakes and Tim Mawson. Next week, normal service will resume with episode 46, Peter Adamson and the history of women in philosophy part one. Thank you for all of your support, especially all of our patrons whose support means the absolute world to us. Projects like this would not be possible without your support. If you want to help us in more projects like this, head over to patreon.com forward slash pansidecast. If you listened to last week's episode, then carry on listening, kick back and enjoy Chapter 8, Gender and Society, Part 2. If you didn't listen to last week's episode, we recommend you head over to the full audiobook page. A link is in the iTunes description. Part 2. Secular Challenges and Responses One is not born, but rather one becomes a woman. No biological, psychological, economic fate determines the figure that the the human female presents in society. It is civilization as a whole that produces this creature, intermediate between male and eunuch, which is described as the feminine. Who is this quotation from, Annabelle? Uh, That is from Simone de Beauvoir, from her book Second Sex. Wonderful. Is, uh, who is Simone de Beauvoir and why are we talking about her? So arguably Simone de Beauvoir is one of the most influential feminist or female philosophers of all time. Um, she wrote The Second Sex in 1949 and it's probably the be- one of the best introductions to feminism and the text of the second wave of feminism. As well as writing The Second Sex, she was a, a prolific writer. She wrote lots of different kinds of things, so plays, um, she wrote lots of books, uh, some novels, some academic, um, some even just straight up philosophy. Very, very influential existentialist thinker um, and who we're going to be focusing on for this section on secular challenges. Just so you've got a date so you know, she was born in 1908 in Paris and died at the age of 78 in 1986 in Paris as well. She's very famous in the field of existentialism. So she kind of bridges feminism and existentialism in her great work, The Second Sex. Ollie, come on, drop some of The Second Sex for us. What's she getting at there? What's the purpose of the book? And how does she go about setting out her arguments? So her main argument is that the mindset of men and women needs to change. Um, And this comes from her own analysis of history and biology. So in The Second Sex, which is a very large book, um, she kind of takes historical and scientific examples of how the feminine, or what we know as the feminine, isn't actually defined by women. Mm. It's defined by men. Um, And men have had the complete kind of monopoly over what it means to be female. So, I mean, can we think of any kind of contemporary examples of this, of how men may define femininity? As opposed to women, can anybody think of any? Well, we spoke earlier about language like don't be a girl and man up. And so that has deep connotations of men being, it's good to be a man, it's good to be powerful. You don't want to be like a girl, says that statement, don't be a girl. And I imagine you're going to go on and talk about how these kind of cultural, these words in our culture, these phrases, this rhetoric that we use, certainly puts women in their place, as it were. It doesn't exactly inspire liberation or something from the chains in which men have put on on women yeah and 
De Beauvoir argues that women have kind of unconsciously allowed this to happen through something called false consciousness. Now, if you're aware of any existentialist ex ideas, false consciousness is very similar to the idea of bad faith. So it's the idea of objectification. Women are objectified by men and fulfill the objectifications of men. So if men want them to be mothers, they'll be mothers. If men want them to be sex objects, they'll be sex objects. Um, and this is kind of very, very harmful to Beauvoir thinks for the feminine and for the female because the female doesn't get to define what it is in of mm. itself. It has to be defined by what a man expects the female to be. There's a really good connection you can make here to film. So there is a theory in film called the male gaze, which is the way that women are shown on film and on TV and things like this is not actually how women are. It's more what men want them to be or mm. think they are like. Um, so, for example... A lot of female characters in, in movies don't talk about anything apart from their relationships to men um, or their way they appear is very artificial or not what the average woman looks like. They may have really unrealistic expectations of parts of their bodies um, or just their the expectation of how they should behave in public, uh, the way they should talk. Um, even unrealistic expectations of the kind of people they are. Are they always flawed characters or do they have, you know, hang ups or good things or, or are they intelligent? You know, there's, there's loads of other things you could unpick about that. But I guess the reason for the connection there is just that the male perception of the female is what's kind of shown in society, shown on film. And that's not actually what De Beauvoir argues the female is. And it shouldn't be defined as such. A couple of themes I want to pick up on here is that in the introduction to the second sex, de Beauvoir likens the condition of women, the second sex, to other oppressed groups, such as um, the, hist the black history, for example. And she says it's very different in the case of femininity and women, because in this sense, women are all over the globe. And, and a woman is a part of a household in which the man controls. Unlike where you have black history, where you have huge groups of oppressed people, at least they're together, she says, at least they can rally together and fight their cause. It's not like women can do that. They're separated across each household. And so they don't have a chance in hell unless they start thinking for themselves and stop living in what her partner, Jean-Paul Sartre, called bad faith. De Beauvoir talks about this idea of the eternal feminine, which is this idea that there are certain innate characteristics of women that are just part of whatever it is to be a, a woman. So we would take this whole idea of being nurturing to children as being uh, part of the eternal feminine. All women have this inbuilt kind of, uh, kind of uh, instinct to be motherly and to care for children. And de Beauvoir is arguing that not all women have this, that this is a, almost like a, an objectification. It's, it's part of this false consciousness. Some women absolutely do have this instinct for, you know, to be a mother. But some men also have this instinct as well, um, that that is not inherent in the entire of, of, of all women. Um, and she thinks this idea of the eternal feminine is really dangerous because what it's led to is it's led to, you know, the situation that she would have been in, in the 60s, you know, living quite an alternative lifestyle with John Paul Sartre. She would have come under very and did come under very harsh criticism for living her life compared to what was expected of her, which would have been to get married, to have a monogamous relationship and have children inside that marriage and to be a housewife. And that for her was not the kind of lifestyle she wanted. And she didn't thought, think that any woman should have to have that lifestyle either. They should have the freedom, that radical freedom, that very existentialist idea to choose of what they want to do. And, you know, in a sense, live in good faith, be, be the female that they want to be defined as themselves, not defined by the objectification of others. So we mentioned this idea of bad faith. And like I mentioned a second ago, it's taken from her partner, Jean-Paul Sartre, a, a huge famous existentialist um, who lived between 1905 and 1980. And his idea here was heavily influenced by Simone de Beauvoir, and, and they complement each other well in their theories and share very similar schools of thought, is that you should will freely and authentically who you are and what you want to be, because as Sartre says, you're radically free. So Simone de Beauvoir kind of runs with these ideas alongside Sartre and says, women need to freely choose what they want to be. Otherwise, they're just going to live in bad faith. They're going to be mechanistic robots determined by the culture and society they're being brought up in. So can we think of any specific female gender roles and duties that are not necessarily intrinsic to sex? Yeah, so there's the idea in society that because of um, a woman's sex, there are therefore certain jobs that are more suited to her gender and her biology, so certain professions. Um, so, for example, men will be better 
engineers and doctors and women will be better at like nursing nurse roles or other or things with kids however i did read a study um last year i've forgotten the name of it um, which spoke about or referred to that the toys we use and give to our children have a really direct impact upon the kind of skills they develop so for example we're more inclined to give a young boys um blocks and puzzles and cars whereas we're more likely to give girls soft toys and babies and things Mm. they can look after and things they can nurture and that that leads on to their development of skills and then this leads on to like jobs they're more inclined to do so men are more likely to go into engineering professions if they've been using things to do with shape and i'm kind of proving a point here myself i can't even describe it but like (laughs) shape and movement and girls have been nurturing their whole lives uh, yeah, well, one of the other really stereotypical ones is anything to do with beauty products. Um, but the thing is, is what's quite interesting about this whole thing um, is that like that doesn't necessarily mean that the people who own these big companies selling beauty products are necessarily women, uh, which brings a whole different dynamic. So you have like very wealthy men at the top of these industries uh and then like but all the products are aimed at women uh and that i would i I don't have the statistics in front of me but i imagine most sort of beauticians are more likely to be women than men and then there's another whole stereotype on top of that which is that people associate gay men with uh with beauty products as well which like links in a whole other type of stereotypical stuff to do with femininity so uh there is a there's a lot of stuff there uh, worth looking at Beauty products actually um, is particularly interesting because beauty products and the selling of them typically get tied to this idea of choice and autonomy. So for women, you'll get like, oh, choose which freebie you want if you buy these products or choose the the best hair shampoo for your hair type. So like through beauty products, women are kind of being given this false sense of freedom and false sense of autonomy, which links into like the neoliberalism that's entwined with post-feminism. Um, and this kind of creates this idea that oh, you're, you're being empowered, you should be happy, but really there's this disempowering underlying tone. Um, as we've mentioned earlier about motherhood or parenthood, um, maybe de Beauvoir will argue something like, well, she's certainly going to argue something like that the role of the woman to stay at home and not pursue the job, um, as Annabelle was just talking about, that that is largely culturally determined as well. And, and the emphasis she puts on to the extent to which it is culturally determined is, I, I want to say, unparalleled compared to a lot of um, feminist writing at the time and, and have written in, in the past because it's saying it's human nature. This is this is what women do by nature. This is their telos, their end, their purpose, linking in all the stuff we said about in part one. This is really challenging, that idea. But de Beauvoir is really saying here that It really is completely down to the opportunities in which you afford women. If you give them a good education, if you allow them to play with these different toys, if you let them choose freely and authentically, they will not follow this pattern which you think is human nature. Probably the most powerful quote, I think, from the whole of the second sex, and it sticks in my mind when I think about it, um, is as follows. Her wings are cut and then she is blamed for not knowing how to fly. It's man who's cut her wings. It's man who's stopping her from fulfilling her potential and and then and then they're cursed or, or blamed for, for for things they can't do and the Beauvoir would argue it's not just men as well that women are completely complicit in this that it's an unconscious false consciousness that women perpetuate this idea of patriarchy and unfair um kind of expectations of what women should be like um so it's not just men saying you should look a certain way you should uh, use certain products you should sound a certain way that actually women enforce this as well and the Beauvoir kind of calls at the end of the second sex for men and women together um, to form some form of what she calls brotherhood where men and women need to work together to try and get rid of this false consciousness um, that it's not just wholly men's fault it is but it's also women's fault as well um de Beauvoir's view interestingly is actually mirrored by uh, Mary Wollstonecraft who a few hundred years earlier um, reiterated the idea that women buy into this their own submissive role. So Wilson Craft is a famous female rights activist known for a vindication of the rights of women and also for being um, the mother of Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein. Um, and as I just said, she she kind of reiterated the idea that women allow themselves to become submissive and value themselves solely for their looks. Because, but but she kind of blames it more on the idea that we don't allow the, these like women at a young age to have a, like, a good enough education to fight back against this. So 
they are denied their potential and because their education is neglected, their adult condition is inevitable, really. So it's similar, but slightly different. So Warstone Cross dates, if you're taking notes, are 1759 to 1769. I just want to carry on what Annabelle's saying here and link in another key scholar, which is Harriet Taylor Mill, 1807 to 1858. Now, I don't want to define her in relation to a man, but she influences, and a lot of scholars think that a lot of John Stuart Mill's work is a direct, is, is Harriet Taylor's actual work. So I don't think it's wrong for me to say that she had a huge influence on him um, but she wrote a book entitled Enfranchisement of Women and I want to give a quotation from here which directly supports both Simone de Beauvoir and Wollstonecraft um, in, in the same theme that being a woman is culturally determined and that Simone de Beauvoir quote one is not born but rather becomes a woman so it's following that same line so this is from Harriet Hardy Taylor Mill from the Enfranchisement of Women there is no inherent reason or necessity that all women should voluntarily choose to devote their lives to one animal function and its consequences. Numbers of women are wives and mothers only because there is no other career open to them, no other occupation for their feelings or activities. So she's saying she's directly going against everything we've said in part one, that there's, this, there's not this human nature, this preordained telos end or purpose, whether it's biblical or embedded in the laws of nature that a woman must fulfill it's culturally determined and the only reason they're stuck being wives that they're stuck in the position in that maternal position which they found themselves in through all of human history is because men don't afford them any other opportunities they are not given the chance to be educated or to apply for a, a different job which is seen as unladylike or something like this I started building an excellent connection there between part two and part one. So can we really criticize these Christian teachings now? Ollie, can you help me out? So let's have a look at the roles of secular feminists, so such as Simone de Beauvoir. We're going to go from page 129 of The Second Sex. This is a criticism of Christianity, and specifically we're going to be looking at quotes from certain Christian saints. And I'm just going to leave you to have a little think about what they had to say about women and gender in society. In a religion that holds the flesh accursed, women become the devil's most fearsome temptation. Tertullian writes, Women, you are the devil's doorway. You have led astray the one whom the devil would not dare attack directly. It is your fault that the Son of God had to die. You should always go in mourning and in rags. St. Ambrose, Adam was led to sin by Eve and not Eve by Adam. It is just and right that women accept as Lord and Master him whom she led to sin. St. John Christendom, among all savage beasts, none is found so harmful as woman. St. Thomas was true to his tradition when he declared that woman is only an occasional and incomplete being, a kind of imperfect man. Man is above woman, as Christ is above man, he writes. It is unchangeable that woman is destined to live under man's influence and has no authority from her lord. So why Simone de Beauvoir included these quotations in her book, The Second Sex? Well, as hopefully is quite obvious, she is very, very critical of Christianity. Um, she thinks that Christianity helps kind of promote this idea of this false consciousness and is helped promoting this unrealistic, objectified expectation of what a woman has to be. And it's quite clear from a lot of those quotations from quite significant Christian saints throughout Christian history that women have been the second sex, mm -hmm. that it's very clear that they're saying that men are more important um, and that women should pretty much be completely submissive and do what men have to say. Um, and a lot of modern uh, Christians and non-Christians would strongly disagree with these quotations and these teachings. Um, they are very uh, almost kind of shocking to the modern ears in a sense, because it's, you know, Christianity is supposed to be a religion based on equality, love and forgiveness. And here we have, you know, quotes from very significant Christian saints saying that women are lesser citizens and lesser people purely for the fact that they are female nothing to do with their character nothing to do with their intention or their faith or their deeds it's just purely down to the sex that they are born with which was out of their control so a little bit harsh some may say so in chapter one we mentioned christopher hitchens and we'll be talking about him again in chapter 12 when we're looking at secular challenges to Christian beliefs. Now, Christopher Hitchens is one of the four horsemen of new atheism, alongside Daniel C. Dennett, Richard Dawkins, and Sam Harris. So Christopher Hitchens 
was what is called an anti-theist, someone who thinks that religion is a force for more bad, evil and suffering than it is good on the whole. And a good example that he used to draw was on the oppression of women. And he thought the oppression of women was a direct cause, it was an effect of religion and specifically Christianity as well. And he had a range of examples and we'll talk about two or three of them over here. He used to use Mother Teresa as an example of somebody who oppressed women. And this goes against what, in the public consciousness, people thought Mother Teresa was a good person, someone who helped alleviate poverty rather than cause it. She was born in 1910 and died in 1997. Ollie, can you give us a little bit of background of St. Teresa and, and her work? Yeah, so Mother Teresa was a missionary so she was a christian missionary so she spread the gospel throughout the world um specifically um in asia so she spent a lot of time in india and what she would do is she would set up orphanages um and kind of not only help um and give medical aid to orphans but also teach the gospel and encourage um certain children to be christian um in the most compassionate way possible now, St. Teresa was a Catholic, it's important to state, and Catholics don't think that contraception should be used. So you're not allowed to use any form of contraception. Um, I'm quoting here from Christopher Hitchens directly. The cure for poverty has a name. In fact, it's called the empowerment of women. If you give women control over the rate at which they can reproduce, if you give them some say, take them off the animal cycle of reproduction to which nature and some doctrine, religious doctrine, condemns them, and then you'll throw in a handful of seeds, perhaps, and some credits, the floor of everything in that village, not just poverty, but education, health, and optimism will increase. It doesn't matter. Try it in Bangladesh, try it in Bolivia. It works. Works all the time. Name me one religion that stands for that or ever has. And this is a perfect quote to sum up his opposition to religion as a cause for the oppression of women. And he thinks if you give women that control over their bodies to decide when they're going to reproduce, then it will alleviate poverty because you've got twice the workforce all of a sudden. And the Catholic Church has been very put under a lot of criticism for not encouraging the use of contraception in Africa, for example. So the continent of Africa has had a massive AIDS epidemic for many years. Um, and this was uh, kind of spreading quite quickly. Um, and the kind of very large amount of Christians in that country, the Pope would have had a lot of influence if he'd encouraged Christians to use contraception um, and more regularly, which to hopefully control the amount of AIDS and then reduce it and then remove mm. it. Um, but he didn't do that. Um, in, in fact, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, yeah, he said, and phenomenally, and this is not, you might think that my notes are stuck together here or something, but they're not. Pope Benedict said that condoms would make African AIDS crisis even worse, which is phenomenal, objectively speaking, because I can tell you, and I'm not a GP or anything, but certainly, biologically speaking, using condoms stops AIDS. Yeah, and, and Mother Teresa and many other Catholics see this. This is where you get to the importance of procreation, right? So the importance of having children. And for Catholics, this and this kind of idea of the family unit, that this is the most important thing. You shouldn't be using artificial forms of contraception. Even natural forms of contraception, like the rhythm method, aren't really encouraged or practiced. And this is you know, a very controversial topic because, you know, if you've got an, uh, a, a disease epidemic like HIV AIDS, um, you know, surely the most loving thing to do would be to, you know, trying to control it and discourage that certain kind of uh, uh, spreading. And linking back to gender and society, if you don't allow women to have control of their bodies, says people like Hitchens, then they're going to inevitably get pregnant. And who's going to be responsible for looking after that child in the home? So the Catholic Church says no contraception. The Catholic Church says no abortion. And then all of a sudden, um, the woman in the household is pregnant. And then all of a sudden, they're, they're forced into that gender role, that culturally determined gender role that Simone de Beauvoir, Waterstorff and Harriet Taylor are all talking about. And the cycle continues. So throughout this chapter, what we've done is we've embedded the Christian responses within the examples we've used. It's as if we were omniscient or something like this. But now what we're going to do is we're going to explicitly define three Christian responses or maybe even secular responses on behalf of the Christian to defend them against the charge of women oppressing. Um, Ollie, do you want to kick us off with the football and with that football analogy we carried on earlier? So my goal here is to have a look at Don Browning and what he did. So in chapter 17 of The Cambridge Companion to Christian Ethics, edited by Robin Gill, he's written a chapter called World Family Trends. And what he does is he actually defends the traditional family and the traditional role of women in the church. And he argues, and I'm going to quote him here, 
The family changes throughout history have contributed to the declining well-being of children. The feminization of poverty, by which I mean the shift of poverty from the elderly to single mothers and their children, and the feminization of kinship, the trend towards women alone sustaining families without the help of fathers and husbands. And he thinks that this increasing uh, different variety of families, the increasing amount of civil partnerships and divorce rates and things like this have actively um, attacked the traditional family. There are less and less traditional families in society. And as a Christian, he thinks that this is very harmful. And he thinks that the best way for society to flourish is for this traditional family. Now, I mean, it's unclear specifically about what he thinks about specific gender roles, but it's very clear from reading the chapter that clearly if you're going to have a traditional family, that does mean that the woman is kind of, you know, the head of the household uh, and that the man is the provider, um, which again goes back to the Christian teachings we were looking at in the first section connected to the Bible and connecting to the teachings of St. Paul. Um, so the church would respond to the secular feminist teaching and say, well, OK, fine, you know, you can have a different type of family. You can have an alternative relationship or you can have, you know, you can have a divorce um, or a civil partnership. But your children are not going to be as happy as children that have a man and a woman raising them in a nuclear family. That It's not going to be the same. They're going to be statistically less likely to do well in school. Um, you know, single parents are statistically more likely to abuse their children and then their children are more likely to abuse others. Um, so by looking at certain kind of studies, Browning kind of argues that he thinks a traditional family is the best way to go um, and that we need to really focus in society to try and reestablish the nuclear family as the kind of uh, best place to raise children and as kind of like as the keystone to, to society. Well, that certainly was a goal. 1-0, Ollie. Can you, uh, can you kick the ball back in Ollie's direction to score your own, Andrew? I'm not quite sure that works, but I'll give it a go. Um, the yeah, the next one I wanted to raise was a kind of a response to the whole existential movement, uh, and obviously in particular response to De Beauvoir, who we've referenced quite heavily through this episode, in which she states that primarily humankind does not have like a distinct nature and what it must live towards, and that there is no kind of uh, nature as such that the Bible has placed forward that says you know men and women have particular roles which they are better suited to and that they should presumably stick towards those now the person that i'll be bringing in for this is very topical at the moment uh, who, uh jordan b peterson who has uh, made the rounds in a lot of different discussions surrounding feminism uh, and surrounding religion and um it, it, I think what kind of broke him onto the scene in the UK was that he had a discussion uh, with Kathy Newman on Channel 4 uh, about this kind of idea that all of the gender roles and stuff were playing a negative impact on society. And Kathy wanted to kind of press him on what he thought about um, the roles of women, men and women in society and what the expectation was there. Um, and he raised a couple of points, and he, uh, but his biggest one was this idea that um, there are certain traits... Remember, he's he's a psychologist, so he's he studied a lot of data on this, which suggests that particular types of traits, regardless of whether or not they are occupied by men or women, do better in certain industries. And one of the things he points to is that the trait of uh, of agreeableness is one in which actually stifles people's trajectory to the top. Now, we haven't used the term glass ceiling yet throughout this episode, but it's a term used which is uh, this indicates that women uh, find it hard to break up to the top level, uh, particularly within business, but that could also be within politics and any any way of life. And that men kind of occupy these top positions. And Peterson kind of says, actually, it's not really men that occupy these top positions. It's people that have certain traits or characteristics that lend themselves well to this, which think could be traits like assertiveness, uh, or it could be sort of a, a, a desire or driven desire to uh, be in in charge of other people now what he says is is that women can have these traits and some do but they are more often found in men so when you do the analysis and you see that there are large amounts of men at the top of business what he's saying is is that it's more likely that to find these traits developed in men than women women now it what the, i guess the interesting point here is whether or not that's entirely down to nature or if it's a bit of both i mean i i imagine that he's he's going to have to concede that it is going to be how we socialize as well as biology um 
but he wants to raise the point that there seems to be like certain things that men are more inclined to do than women and that might not all be to do with the fact that they were taught that boys are, are business leaders and girls are, are kind of uh, mothers that actually maybe there's something more biological to that than simply just saying that it's that it's all down to culture one all good good shooting there andy um annabelle do you want to jump in on this yeah so in terms of christianity if we look in the new testament so uh, galatians three twenty eight, we've got this um this passage where it says that there isn't a male and there isn't a female for we're all one in christ jesus so this from a christian perspective suggests that there aren't necessarily these these massive gender or sex norms and limitations placed upon people because we are all one in the eyes of god in the eyes of, of jesus However, on the flip side to that, um, looking at the document, the Vatican document we looked at earlier, we referred to earlier, um, Malaria Stigatatum, that does suggest that we, okay, yeah, there's a sense of equality, but there are differences and we have differences. So, okay, we might all be the same, but there are certain things that we are, as, well, as a woman, I'm supposed to be more inclined to and better at and can share with with my family and with society better than say a man a man could so you've got this well specifically in the sense of motherhood so okay we've got the sense of equality but when it comes down to a theme within uh, gender and society like motherhood there are certain well restrictions mm. and limitations although the church wouldn't call it that they probably call it like a special place or special skills um <laughs> that yeah that are placed upon women Goal, that's 1-1-1 one, one, one in this game of football. <laughs> he said we were going to conform to the rules of society. <laughs> da, 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 da. Theological ultimatum. So, it's theological ultimatum. Everybody's favourite part of the chapter. Are we looking forward to this instalment? Can't wait. Good, me too. <laughs> um, This time we've got Annabelle joining us. Annabelle, do you know the rules? Yeah, no. No, okay. <laughs> um, so basically, we're going to have a buzzer each, and it's going to go something like this. Ollie's buzzer goes... Simone! Your buzzer goes... Oh, d d d o d And Andy's buzzer goes... Beauvoir. Beauvoir. So we've no, got not Simone. de Beauvoir. We've already had the D. Oh, okay. So yeah. I'm just Beauvoir. Okay, Simone, so we've got Simone, Dare. Dare. D I'm Beauvoir. not... <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. I feel like I've got a it's short deal here. It's it's de de that's fine. French. De good jingles. De um, so I'm going to give you the... Specification defined analysis questions are really important for studying the course. And um, but here's the catch: you've only got forty three seconds to answer them. And if you go over the time, I deduct all of your points in mm. your disqualified. Any reason for forty three there? Jeff? No, that's interesting. Is it? <laughs> I guess <laughs> it's been thirty <laughs> seconds for the rest. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there you go. Um, at the moment, according to my notes, we have quite the ordeal ahead of us because we had Ollie win the first three, Andy win the next three. Then it was a draw. Ooh. So at the moment, it's three all between you. Um, Annabelle, of course, if it stays a draw when we reach for the chapter 12 and you win the point today, then you could very well win the prize, which I'll give another clue today. Um, it's King J something is going to be oh. the prize. Okay. Um, no Joseph. guessing or else you'll be disqualified. Oh, well, yeah. I, think I, just got this one. <laughs> I didn't hear it. I'll let you off. Um, so here we go. Here's the first question. Buzz in with your answer. Should Christian teachings resist current secular views? Of gender. D. Oh. Um, no, because the secular views on gender are allowing women to expand and expand, <laughs> physically expand, um, <laughs> go, develop new roles in society. And whereas the Christian views, some of them are holding women back. Um, yep, yeah, that's it. It's <laughs> good. You sure you got another 10 seconds? Oh, have I? Okay. Um, especially in terms of motherhood, because motherhood, Emily from Virgin Mary is really restricting. Good. That was well, very good. Um, points for analogies, by the way. Analogies are well, really good. Well, I wasn't good. told that in the instructions. Okay, well, ne maybe next time. <laughs> and Andrew, Beauvoir. No, they they shouldn't change. Surely, if there is a natural order that God has imposed upon His creation, then it would make sense that there are certain things that are in place. Now, mm. it's not that women are necessarily inferior that some of the saints might have suggested. Uh, I I believe that the 
Christian teaching here is going to be that they are equal but with different roles. I mean, that's the that's the typical response from the Catholic Church, and that it's not that women are being kind of mistreated. They 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 have a certain place, an important place within within Christianity, and that they are respected in that sense. So I think the Christian Church. Five seconds. The Catholic Church in particular are going to reject this fact. Wonderful, <laughs> Re- really good, fantastic. Simone, uh, off you go. Okay, so. Equal but with different roles is not equal by definition. Um, and I think they need to get the rule differ- difference here between equality and fairness. There are sex differences between men and women. And there are differences in the gender norms and expectations of men and women. And for Christianity to engage with Marxism, to engage with pluralism, and engage with other ideas, and not engage with feminism would be completely ridiculous. Um, if you are a forward-thinking person, individual, as part of an institution of a church or a religion, engaging with ideas is helpful. It helps you clarify your own ideas, and it could be potentially help you to maybe Three change your, your opinions if needed to be so nice very good well done and wrapped up nicely at the end uh that's one nil two annabelle um no explanations for why points are <laughs> given of course secular views of gender equality have undermined christian gender roles Beauvoir. <laughs> I uh, yeah I think at this point in history um particularly if you're in the UK uh then then yes the the underlying social norms are shifting to a point in which legally uh we're moving away from the the typical traditional views of Christianity um so we talked about second wave fe- feminism right at the start of our episode and we said that this laid the groundwork for certain rights for women that weren't given past the vote um perhaps the biggest one was the 1967 abortion act which Mm. meant that women finally had uh the right to be able to uh terminate a pregnancy in which they decided that they wanted to do so uh and it started at 28 weeks and was then later reduced to 24 weeks the point of viability but the point is is that the catholic church would be adamantly against this view um however other other types of christianity outside of catholicism have leaned more towards accepting that this is the way of life now um so while the say the church of england do not believe that abortion is something which should be opted for specifically uh they do recognize that under certain circumstances such as rape uh that actually that that is the right thing to do and that the, who knows given enough time maybe church will become more and more accommodating to women's rights in regarding this issue. Who wants to jump so, in next? Uh, Off you go, Ollie. Okay, so I'm going to actually agree with Andy, um, and I think that there's other things we can look at too. Um, the invention of the contraceptive pill, giving women control over their own reproductive systems, being able to control have family planning, right? Control when they can and can't have children, I think has liberated women um, much more than I think a lot of maybe Christian theologians would like to think. I think the question is a little bit misleading because it says Christian gender roles i think traditional christian gender roles absolutely but i think you can be a modern 21st century christian and not necessarily have those traditional gender roles and um, i think you can be a, a forward-thinking christian feminist if you want to be and be purely inspired by the teachings of jesus or maybe some of the stuff in the new testament yes you know there is stuff in there that could be seen as sexist as well but as we've gone through this episode there is thing a lot of those stories can be read, uh, read in different ways a lot of those teachings have two sides to them and that actually, you know, if, you, if we go back to chapter one, when we look at the kind of revolutionary nature of Jesus as a liberator, he could be here to liberate women too. D. Um, so I, I'm going to go on the other side um, and say that it hasn't undermined Christian gender roles because arguably the gender roles one can derive from the Bible um, could suggest an empowering stance towards women and which reflects like a secular view that women can be more engaged with um, or should allow, should be more engaged with politics and governance. So um, as Ollie just said, looking back to the uh, the previous sections, women like Abigail in the Bible and like Esther are taking do take an active role. So this isn't undermined by what's happening in society because arguably women have been doing this throughout the whole Bible. Wonderful. Perfectly in the conditions of the time I set out beforehand. Um, I was going to let you know at the end, but I won't leave you hanging, guys. Uh, Andrew, you're way over the time mark there, and Ollie as well. So you will be disqualified from the whole game of Theological Ultimatum. Uh, but do not deprive these audiobook listeners from the enjoyment that is Theological Ultimatum, please, and continue as if... You, what you I, I, I wasn't aware that you were cracking such a harsh whip, Jack. But, Question uh... three. Is liberating... Is, is motherhood liberating 
moderating or restricting? Simone. Okay, so I'm going to go with the restricting route. I think there's nothing wrong with motherhood and, you know, lots of people would say, of course, there's nothing wrong with motherhood at all. But if your entire sex and gender identity is defined by being a mother, then, you know, Simone de Beauvoir, for example, is going to say you're living in false consciousness. You're living in bad faith. You're not fully embodying your full radical freedom. You're being completely defined by something which is outside of your your control. Yes, you can be a mother. Yes, you can enjoy having children, but that shouldn't be your complete identity. There are other things that make you you, especially your choices. And you should make full authentic choices as often as you can by living, getting rid of this false consciousness and being a true uh, if you're a female woman, um, or having a true idea of your yourself. D. Uh, I'm going to go with restricting on the condition that motherhood is combined with virginity. When these two are put together as something to emulate, then very, very restricting. Um, Ranga Hyman, who was um, the first woman to gain a chair in Catholic theology and also the first woman to lose it uh, after being excommunicated, um, says that, okay, it's useful to have someone like Mary, um, to prevent total masculine dominance within the Catholic Church. However, Mary is so radically different from other women that her view of motherhood or the motherhood that we can derive from her but arguably is extremely restricting. Andrew, are you going to jump in here? Uh, I mean, that, that I would certainly agree with both Annabelle and, and Ollie's points there, but I'll try and give her the other side of things as I'm mm. not sure we've yet to hear this. Um, so uh, motherhood being liberating. I mean, I, th- I think... It's one of those ones that, particularly in the modern era, that like because there is now a swinging emphasis on on this idea that everybody has the right to choose their own lives and stuff like that. Um, that there is a, a potential risk, potentially from the Catholic perspective, that we actually almost demonize or look down on people who might choose to take the role of the mother as a primary part of their life rather than pursuing some sort of other ends. Uh, that actually there is nothing to be ashamed of if a, if the mother chooses to stay at home, look after their kids, educate their kids. Uh, and particularly within religious families, it's often seen as the mother's role to educate their child in their faith as well as all the other skills that life requires and that that should not be overlooked. And that if your if your role, as it were, if you were to define yourself under one role was a mother, then that could be a very powerful role to have. You have the influence over the lives of other people and you could shape the world as it were. Um, and in that sense, I, could, I guess it could be quite liberating, but nothing is ever liberating or completely restrictive i think this is a hard one to get by one of the best answers that theological automation has been graced with i might add and so i'll liberate you of the shackles of having your disqualification that's lifted now andrew ollie is still disqualified and um, so according to my watch which is a bit off today it's two all between annabelle and andrew final question are we ready sure good good yep yeah ollie you ready Sure. Should we try that again? Final question. Are we ready? Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Right, okay. Is the idea of family entirely culturally determined? Is it in... uh, Beauvoir? No. Uh, (laughs) The... uh, Yeah, I I think this... uh, Going to, to say the word entirely culturally determined is is a very very difficult thing to defend, um, because that is saying that absolutely all of our behaviours as a family unit must be dictated by the culture that we're around, and that and that that's sort of set in stone, as it were, by that. But uh, I think it seems if you look back, and I'm going to use that word, it seems again uh, that the throughout throughout human history. There have been certain things that have happened over and over again, and not because of one particular culture, but because they keep cropping up. And if that is involving, like, say, a woman who more typically stays at home uh, and looks after the kids because ultimately they like they didn't get the choice they had to because like if they, somebody wasn't doing that then they risk their baby dying for, at a young age uh then that isn't necessarily the culture dictating that's like a necessity of life that says like this needs to be the case now that is not to say that now every single family lives within that reality now and that they must live with under these dictates but it might say that to say that it's all culturally determined seems a bit silly uh there must have been times in human history where women had to stay at home it's more likely that the man is going to have to then go out and provide stuff because they need to to bring stuff home to also take care of the baby and that it just was easier to do that dynamic 
than the other way around. Wonderful. Um, Simone. Yes, Holly. One is not born, but rather becomes a woman, <laughs> wow. Andrew. Are those your own words? Yes. No, uh, the words of Simone de Beauvoir. Um, she's not saying this is biological. She's saying this is existential, that actually this the idea of what a woman is in the culture is completely defined by the patriarchal, male, objectified culture, that women in society are not what we think uh, sorry, are what what men think they should be and what other women think they should be. They're not who they fundamentally are, who they should be by living rad- being radically free and getting rid of this false consciousness. So someone like a second wave feminist like Simone Beauvoir is going to disagree. Um, yes, there may be certain, uh, you know, scientific or biological uh, impulses or chemical differences between the sexes, but ultimately one is not born but rather becomes a woman. <laughs> Uh, nice. I know that this is uh, yes, untypical on. of uh, theological ultimatum, and I'm happy to lose the point on behalf of this. Um, well, what but, a martyr you yeah, are. I know, right? <laughs> um, but like, I guess that kind of missed the point of the question, because the question was talking about like family norms, not not just the role of women. And that when I talked about a point in history, it's not necessarily saying that like this is this is like the way in which women wanted it to be, nor the way that men wanted it to be. Mm. It was just a fact of life that this was kind of the more convenient way to do things if they need to. And if a woman decided to be radically free during certain points in, in uh, human history, the babies could have just ended up dying because the mothers wanted to go off and live the life that they decided to You've live. You've both been martyrs there. Andrew, you're a martyr because you're disqualified. Sure. Ollie, you're a martyr for the listeners who need to remember to read the question carefully during the exam. Annabelle, the stage is yours. Thank you. I'm going to try and combine the two. Um, Okay, so the idea of family could be culturally determined because the concept of family in itself is determined by our cultural perception of gender. So if you look at the idea, the work of gender theorist Judith Butler, she says, argues that gender is performative in nature. So gender doesn't produce certain acts, but the acts and the things we do produce a concept of gender. So gender, she calls gender an imitation for which there is no original. So through these gender performances, we create a concept of what a man should be like and what a woman should be like, even within family and a family unit. So therefore, arguably, gender becomes very determined by the outward surroundings. It's quite clear who the winner is for this theological ultimatum. So let's give her a round of applause. Yeah, I'm breaking through the glass ceiling. <laughs> that was kind of an analogy. It's, yeah. Yes, there you go. go. Yeah, I knew it was point. in there somewhere. <laughs> so that's three to Andrew, three to Ollie, and one to Annabelle. And that was chapter eight, Theological Ultimatum. Um, Annabelle, you'll be joining us next time as well. I shall. Look forward to it. Did you know that um, the Hebrew word Adam literally translates to man? And yes, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is supposed to be a bit of banter, yeah. Annabelle. I'm we sorry. don't need to hear your. Tell me something new. <laughs> and the Hebrew for apple. Do we know what that is? Do we know what the Hebrew, Hebrew for apple? Oh, Adam's apple. No, not Adam's apple. S- swollen, uh, swollen. Oh. So there so you that's go, where hey, it guys. Comes from. I've got some more readings from the second sex. So this is supposed oh. to be bad. So, <laughs> <this is, laughs> so Tertullian Lower defines a woman as a temple built over a sewer. That's a, that's, that's lovely. Isn't a it? temple really built weird. over a sewer. That's quite graphic. Yeah. Well, that's quite um, useful though. Really. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. so, <laughs> <laughs> Who wouldn't want a sewer underneath their building? Um, and, and Saint Augustine is famous for saying that we are born between feces and urine. Used to oh, so much up. sewage, all yeah. the sewage. Yeah, I mean, these guys really had a problem with that birth canal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all sewage. <laughs> 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 Lovely. <laughs>